Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. All right, so this is going to be the last of the wines that I'll be doing uh, in this session. And I'm really excited to do this. And uh, yeah, so let's just get into what this wine is, and I'll kind of do the history of the area. So this is the 2015 Jacobian Hobbs RNE Rind. Uh, and I'm so for, it's from Armenia. $26.95. Uh, I paid for it at Central Market, originally $29.95. So first of all, Armenian, as far as the language, I'm going to do the best I can with this because Google Translate is really just kind of winging it worse than I would be. So uh, if, I'm, if you're using uh, Uzbek, maybe try that. Uh, it doesn't say, it won't even give you pronunciation. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna do the best I can. So according to Google Translate, it's Yalkalbian, but I, and when I look at it, it's Jacobian, so I'm not really sure. So I know someone's last name. I apologize, gentlemen, if I'm mispronouncing the last name, but uh, we will go from there. So who, who is this? So Jacobian Hobbs, so Hobbs is Paul Hobbs. You may know that name. You may have seen my episode 322 back from uh, 2015, like January is 2015, from my visit in 2014 to not just Napa, but also Sonoma. I went to Sonoma in, for a day and went to the Paul Hobbs Winery slash Cross Barn. That's where we sat down. I sat down with, um, oh, real quick, who did I sit down with? <laughs> Greg, that's right, Greg Rimini. How could I forget a fellow Italian? Anyway, um, anyway, I sat down with Greg, who I found out also I had reviewed one of his wines prior, which was kind of cool. Uh, maybe I said it was episode 332. Actually, it was after that. It was the Greedy with Jan, uh, getting greedy with Ron, Jan. So uh, maybe I'll do a, a, a link to that one too. That was, that was Greg's wine. But anyway, so Paul Hobbs, it's kind of like one of those guys who shouldn't need any introduction, but give you the short version or the shorter version if you want to get the longer version of the history of Paul Hobbs or who he is. Watch that episode, but real quick. So he's from upstate New York. He grew up on a farm. Uh, eventually, he went to UC Davis and got a master's of science in viticulture and enology. Uh, he's worked for a lot of wineries, uh, namely Robert Mondavi was his first place. Then he switched over to Opus One to be part of the inaugural uh, winemaking team. He worked for Simi, Peter Michael, etc., a bunch of places. In '91, he purchased grapes from Larry Hyde and Richard Di Dinner. Diner? Dinner? Um, yeah, dinner. Well, it's pronounced it, it, Diner, D-I-N-N-E-R. Hmm. Um, and that's when the Paul Hobbs wine brand was born. So Larry Hyde, I, Richard, I don't know as well, but Larry Hyde, like, definitely you should you, know, you should know who both these guys are. But I know Larry Hyde a lot more. Um, I mean, he only married like you know some a daughter of like a really really famous winemaker from France from Burgundy. So. Um, Anyway, I think I got the story right. I hope I did. In 1998, he established the actual estate in Sebastopol, California, and then or, Paul Hobbs did. And over the years, he's been a consultant or partnered with many wineries around the world, including this wine. So uh, I used a couple articles plus Wikipedia to supplement a lot of the information I'm getting about Armenian wine. And this is the wine I refer to, what, almost seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago, um, about the historical wine areas, because this is definitely one of them. And I'll give you the list here in a second. Anyway, so there's two brothers here that are partnered with Paul Hobbs. They were born in Lebanon, but they're Armenian. And they grew up in, in LA. Uh, Viken, I'm assuming it's Viken, V-I-K-E-N. 
uh, Jacobian, he, or Jacobian, he emailed Paul back in 2003, living in the States, uh, after drinking one of uh, Paul's Pinot Noirs. And from that email, a friendship developed eventually a business partnership. <clears throat> so the brothers don't have a background in winemaking. Uh, they're businessmen, uh, but they're definitely passionate about their Armenian heritage, and they want to promote uh, the history of Armenian wine. So especially since the area where the winery is is very close to what is now considered the world's first winery, at least documented winery, from 4100 BC. Now you may have remembered that I, when I was talking about uh, Turkey, that I mentioned that Georgia and China have histories that date back to 6000 BC and 7000 BC, but they haven't found the actual wineries, but they have found wine that was made. They just haven't found the winery. So everybody wants to claim to be the first, the oldest and things. So right now, as far as the oldest documented winery, or winery you have evidence of, uh, Armenia has it. But there has been wine in Georgia, which is like right next door to Armenia, um, and uh, China, which has had fermented beverages besides just grapes. So they all, have, so fermentation of, of grapes and other fruits as, and other grains has been around for a long time. Let's put it that way. Uh, let's see. It is called... RNE1. It was discovered in 2007. And this is actually from the uh, Sever article that I have a link to below. And then the partnership for these guys started in 2008. So, yeah, you, you find out that you have the world's oldest winery in the world, and you're like, and you have developed a friendship with this badass winemaker who like, consults everybody, Paul Hobbs. Boom, hook up, right? I mean, I'm not sure this is exactly how it happened, but it seems kind of obvious. So they started planning in 2014. So they took a long time figuring out where they wanted to kind of build this winery that they're doing. And the Vyot Zor, and again, Google Translate really failed on pronouncing this. Like it was like Zizor. I'm like, maybe that's how it's pronounced. But when I put the Vyot, V-A-Y-O-T-S in there, it, it totally ignored it. Unless I put it by itself. And it said Vyot. Okay. So uh, this area is, is near Mount Ararat, and you may remember from the Turkey episode that this is, the legend is, you know, Noah, you know, land, you know, that's where the ark is, and then Noah planted grapes in the area, implying Turkey rather than Armenia, but in the area. And the winery is about 60 miles from the mountain. So I should have a map coming up here. So the area of Vyatzor is actually next to Ararat, which is another region of Armenia, and these are just, these are Armenian regions, not wine regions, but a lot of times, especially countries like this, whatever the actual region name is, is usually the, the, the wine region just takes that name up anyway. Um, so ancient wine culture that also is one of the newest, and here's the thing. So since the 19th century, the czarist, in the czarist area, era, Armenia was, quote, decreed to be a brandy uh, producing country. Now, this is more from the Sever uh, article, but then there's another article that I've also linked to uh, that is from uh, the Smithsonian Magazine that also has some other information. Anyway, so brandy was a big thing, and since almost all the grapes grown went to brandy or fortified wines, like, a, like sherry type or Madeira type, that was actually from the Smithsonian article. Uh, rather than wine, it wasn't really known as a wine country. Uh, Georgia actually was more of a wine country for the Soviet Union in the Soviet era. Um, let's see. From 2000, 2019, the Sever article, yeah, that, that article said 95% of the grapes were still destined to be distilled. Uh, I mean, it has a fairly extreme climate. So it's, while it's on the same latitude as Sicily, um, it's not like it's not like you know Mediterranean because Sicily is like literally an island in a big ocean. Uh, the grapes are grown at altitudes anywhere from two thousand feet to fifty seven hundred feet. So you got to you got you have high altitude, not necessarily because of mountains, just you have a high altitude, kind of like the high plains. They're high and they're plains out in Texas. They we're talking like thirty five to four thousand feet there. So you're getting a high altitude benefit, even though it's not mountain slopes. Um, and so that makes them some of the highest in the northern hemisphere. 
And it says, except for a small vineyard in Colorado. That's from the Sever article. I don't know where the vineyard in Colorado is, but it's probably higher than 5,700 feet. Now, there's famously a uh, vineyard down in South America and Argentina that's like 10,000 feet. So you can grow grapes pretty high up. Um, it also has an extreme continental climate. So that means normally you see continental, it's going to be cold winters and hot summers. Take those to another level or two, like super cold and super hot. So you need to have hardy grapes to survive the winter. And of course, grapes that can survive extreme heat. Now, no matter what grapes they are, at some point, photosynthesis shuts down if it gets too hot. They can't respire. So you have to have grapes that can handle that still without like, yeah. Um, let's see. Armenia did not become its own country until 1991, however, at least as far as the modern era. Yes, it was its own country and all that. It had been part of kingdoms. And then there was, um, uh, the gen I think it was like something called the Armenian Genocide. I didn't really read too much about that. So I was really focusing on the wine. But it sounds like there was the kingdom of Ar Armenia. And then the Ottoman Empire came in and did some terrible things, you know, as, well, as empires do. I'm not excusing it because it's just history of our world is bad things happen all the time for really no reason, in my opinion. But um, just because you look different or something. Anyway, um, or talk differently or sound differently or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, a little soapbox there. But anyway, it would took until about 2006 or so for Armenian wine as a wine industry rather than being distilled, you know, using for distillation to be, have a rebirth. And like even now it's a really small market. Small market. Uh, so this wine. And I have another wine from this winery that I'll review at a later date, uh, are kind of rare compared to other countries. Matter of fact, uh, I think I'm skip ahead. There's only 1,100 cases produced of this thing for the entire world. Now, I don't know how much of it makes it to the United States. Probably a lot because of Paul Hobbs. You know, it's probably a lot of the markets here. But uh, even if it, all of it came to the United States, 1,100 cases is not a lot of production. Okay, that's. What so a thousand cases is uh, twenty? Uh, it's a twelve hundred bottles, right? Twelve twelve bottles, so twelve thousand bottles, right? Yeah, not a lot of bottles to spread around. All right, so let's see here. Some other notable producers. This came from the Sever article. Vozniki, uh, Vozniki. Zora, Kataro, and Zabel. And I have links below for all these. Some are better than others. So just look at the description to see which ones have like valid links and others are kind of not so valid. Um, so the reason the ancient grapes are still around is credited to the Soviet system of creating large nurseries for the brandy and or fortified wine industries. Uh, so instead of like bringing in Cabernet Sauvignon and other and like the typical brandy varieties of like Colombard and uh, Folie Blanche and that kind of stuff, uh, Trebbiano, um, they actually use the native grapes. Let's see here. Um, also, the extreme climate is better suited to the native varieties because, well, that's where they're from. And also, this area of the world, this like this the melding of Asia and Europe, the trans-Eurasian whatever area, a lot of these grapes are like the genetic parents of some of the grapes that we drink today. Maybe not directly, but somewhere along the line, these are like the, the almost like the original genetic material of some of the other grapes that we're getting. Uh, let's see here. Armenian grapes. So from the Sever article, they list... Four grapes, and so Arini or Arini uh, is the best known variety. It's a thick skin, late ripening grape. It's considered one of the country's finest and produces fresh, bright red wines with soft, elegant red fruit flavors. Then you have Kaket, Kaket, K A K H E T, uh, as a late, late ripening variety. Uh, thinner skin than Arini, Arini is a deep velvet purple in color. Small berries that make for sweet, fresh floral juice. Sireni um, is originally from Nagorno uh, Karabakh, it's a, which is a disputed territory in the South Caucasus. Caucasus, Caucasus. 
uh, is a thick skin red grape with tannic structure. It ages and develops reliably well in barrel. Go figure, has a lot of tannin, good for aging. And then uh, Chichlar, T C H I L A R. Yeah, Google like totally botched that one. Uh, or maybe botched it more than I did. Rare and nearly extinct until recently, uh, Chichlar is a grape to watch in the coming years. It's mildly floral with a distinctive structure and falls somewhere between Sauvignon Blanc and Gruner Veltliner. All right, so from the website, in the village of Rind, or Rind, I'm not really sure, uh, the r &E grape thrives in rich volcanic and limestone soils. Hot summers are tempered by cooler temperatures uh, at these high elevation sites. Water is uh, provided by the melting snow caps atop Mount Ararat. Uh, it's 100% of the grape variety. Elevation is 4,000 feet, 1,300 meters. Fermentation happens in fermentation and aging happens in stainless steel, so no oak. And like I said, production is limited to 1,100 cases. Come on, get up in there. So I'll have a this particular episode has a ton of links. So I've got the link to the cross wine episode. I'll, I'll try to remember the link to the other episode with Greg's wine, the winery Wikipedia to give you some more information about Armenian wine, and then the two magazine articles, the two articles on the on the net, and then the four other wineries uh, will be there. So let's check it out. That's what I'm super excited about trying this wine, Armenian wine. I don't think I've ever had Armenian wine. This is a first. So really on the nose, it's not a whole lot going on. Um, maybe it's just got, you know, I'm on wine, I'm on episode seven of, of the wines. This is what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine wines total in seven episodes. But... I mean, the other two red wines I did were pretty aromatic, especially the Cape Francos was super aromatic. But it's more of a dried red fruit that I'm getting. Cranberry-ish. A little bit of spice. But really, it's just not highly aromatic. Which in some ways makes sense because this is a stainless steel wine, so you don't get the oak characteristics that you normally can get. Not that old oak is aromatic necessarily but a lot of times if you're using old or used oak it's because the red wine already the wine already has enough aromatics you don't need to add to it right <clears throat> so let's taste it spice driven wine oh yeah i totally skipped over the whole historic did I totally skip over it? I totally skipped over it. Okay, so let me backtrack real quick. So the countries of Armenia, Georgia, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Iran, Turkey, and Syria are given the designation of historic world when it comes to wanting to distinguish them from old world and new world. I don't have an exact date for this like change, but the Sever article left out like Iran, Syria, I think in Jordan, I think I left out those. The Smithsonian Magazine article had the same countries that Sever, Savor, how does it pronounce again? Sever, yeah, uh, article, and then added the other ones. Not sure they left them out on purpose because they're you know, it's Iran, right? Lebanon, which you think they would leave in there because they, these guys were born in Lebanon. Maybe Lebanon was in there. Um, Syria was taken out. I'm almost positive. But um, I don't remember now because I just kind of inserted them. I know Armenia, Georgia, Israel, and Jordan were definitely in there. And I, I didn't put them in the order like the Sefer article and then the Smithsonian. I kind of just inserted however I did. So some were definitely, like, at least two or three were not in the original, the Sefer article. Anyway. I just want to mention that Turkey is part of the historic world, 
and so is Armenia and Georgia and all them. So like I said, it was spice driven on the palate. But not as spicy as that Key Francos I had. And it's also brambly. It's also like this, I hate to say stemminess, but like a bramble and a woodsy quality to it. Again, not oak aging, and not oak wood, but like a woodsy bramble, like you're in a, in a, oh, what's it? Nettle, kind of a nettle type of thing. There's uh, dried fruit. The cranberries there, the raspberries there, um, spice as far as like like a um, like a clove kind of clove, but I know there's no oak on this, so clove usually comes from oak, but there's like a pepper quality to it, like a black pepper. So it's a lighter wine. So I was thinking it was going to be the heaviest of the three wines. And it's really the lightest of the three red wines I'm doing today. So I probably should have done this one first. <laughs> so, um, I mean, when it said thick skinned and, you know, but it says fresh, bright red wines with soft, so soft and elegant red fruit flavors. I would agree with that. It's not, a soft, it's not a full bodied wine. It's not a fuller bodied wine like, like that, well, that GSM that I had. I know I'm looking over there. So the wines are over there. Elegant is a really good quality, a really good uh, term to call this. So this is more like a Beaujolais, a Cru Beaujolais for me. It's got a lot of that spice characteristics, but without the oak aging. Uh, somewhat of like a Grenache, somewhat like Pinot Noir. There's all these types of of um, spice components, red, dried red fruit components. Um, the acid's pretty elevated too. So you're getting that. Uh, the alcohol, I don't believe is really high at all. Let's see, did they give me the, they didn't give us the alcohol on, on the text sheet, but I don't think it's really high. 14%. So I mean, it's, it's elevated for sure, but it's not like a high alcohol wine. But I mean, it's delicious. Like, I think what it was, I was expecting a bigger, bolder wine. It kind of took me off, took me by surprise. But now that I've had time to kind of sip on it, it's, it's outstanding. Now, maybe I'm predisposed to like it because it's Paul Hobbs. But, I mean, now that I'm tasting the wine a little bit more, instead of just like, I'm just trying to say, what's the wine giving me rather than having a preconceived notion by what I thought it was going to be like? Because I really didn't read the, I didn't really read tasting notes on it. Yeah. This is definitely more in that elegant, not big, bold in your face wine. It's definitely good. And I did it again. I didn't start the, I didn't start this. I'm so sorry. I'm so excited about doing this wine. I got and I got kind of out of my little routine. Anyway, too late now because I'm going to finish the episode. So I'm just going to wrap it up for this episode. Click the links above, friend me up. There'll be links below to tons of stuff. If you find this wine out there, definitely buy it. And we'll see everyone again next time.